Petra ELT evening. Actually, the correct pronunciation is Pachachka, and it's a Japanese word originally meaning chit chat. A Pachachka is a form of presentation uh, designed as an antidote to what people sometimes call death by PowerPoint. It was started by um, two designers based in Tokyo. Um, I guess what they had seen was long and boring presentations full of boring slides, too much text on the slides, too long and just going on and on. So they designed this format, which is called Pachachka. In a Pachachka presentation, the presenter is allowed 20 slides. And each slide changes automatically after 20 seconds. We've been doing it in ELT at all these conferences, and it's been happening around the world in design and business in more than 80 countries and 290 cities. I'm going to do a pachachka to demonstrate this on the topic of M learning. M learning being mobile learning, the new thing in education. Can you hear me okay like this? Yes. Yes? Okay. So M learning, the new thing in education, this is going to be my pachachka. M learning standing for mobile learning. Here I have a picture of my first mobile phone. Do you remember your first mobile phone? Yes. Does it look a bit similar to this? Yes, mine was an enormous thing with a little antenna. You couldn't do that much with it in class. I could, I could make a phone call, but there was, all, there was nothing else I could do. So we would pretend in class, if I used it as a teacher, they would pretend to make phone calls or use it as a gun, perhaps. Um, but now, things have moved on. Um, phone devices or mobile learning devices, there are all kinds of things. There are e-readers like the Kindles, these little tiny netbook computers, there's one on the table here, the famous <coughs> iPad or the iPhone. And why is this becoming important in education now? Why is this M learning is becoming a new buzzword? Well, for one, the price of these devices are going down drastically. Here's a picture of a Dell notebook in a back-to-school catalog for $199. So as the price goes down, it is becoming more and more accessible to learners and of interest, perhaps, to teachers. The second thing that they say about M-learning and why it might be moving into education, these devices, is what they call the 21st century button. We're not using keypads so much anymore, we're using touch screens. And more importantly now, is getting into gestures. If you've seen the Kinect game console, they, um, they move, the person moves and the, the things on the screen change as you move. The other thing is that with these devices now, it's called convergence. You don't have a phone, a camera, an MP3 player, etc. It all goes into one device. And so what people are beginning to say is the potential for this in education is huge. Students have very powerful computers in their pockets. One of the things that is suggested for teachers to start using this is apps. These are some applications, dictionaries, um, word games, English grammar and use app, New York Times app for language learners. The whole idea of M-learning is catching on, but interestingly, in um, developing countries. Here are examples of two projects for M-learning. In Sri Lanka, students are learning uh, reading and uh, literacy skills with mobile phones, and there's a mobile project in South Africa which encourages students to learn mathematics through their mobile phones on the go. So, should we be doing this? How could we introduce this into our lessons? Here are two students. They are probably listening to music there, but they could also be doing English homework. This is what lots of the educators are getting at, the idea of using this kind of time when they're listening to stuff to be doing English work. For example, in a project I worked on called Global, we have downloadable videos and downloadable audio files of word lists, conversations, etc., for students to download and listen to on an MP3 player phone or whatever. This is what they're talking about with M-learning, maximizing learning outside the classroom. Another thing that people are talking about, uh, learners are doing, is forcing English on themselves with these devices. So for example, changing the Google page so that it's English and not your native language, changing your phone language to be English, changing the GPS in your car to be giving you the instructions in English. These are all examples of learners engaging in uh, M-learning with the devices that are around them. M-learning can also be used in class, and some people are beginning to use this in class for either instant web searches or using corpus tools, getting students to check frequency of words. 
I went a little bit quickly. Um, but I also, uh, to close off, I had some critical questions about this. Well, a lot of this is still new, but it's worth thinking about some of these things and how they can re reflect critically in education. The first is, <laughs> are we wrong to ban phones in class? Several of the advocates of M-learning and the new technology says we are absolutely wrong to ban phones in class. They say it is a disastrous thing for us to do this. We should be instead training the learners how to use these devices to include, increase their English, to improve their English. Is this true? Are we wrong to ban uh, phones in class? What about the poorest classroom, the classroom that lets everything in? The other side of that says, do you really want to be competing with Facebook farm animals and Twitter and the students' emails and YouTube and all that? Is that what we are saying? And if, if that's what we are saying, how do we compete with that as teachers? What about the poorest classroom? Sometimes people talk about M learning as anytime, anywhere learning. Isn't that a wonderful thing? They can learn anytime, anywhere. Great. But do we want anytime, anywhere teaching? Does this mean the students will then eventually start thinking, I can just get in touch with my teacher when I want uh, to, to answer a question? And the last part of the question is, whose interests is this serving? The more that you start hearing about end learning and learning with iPads and so on, um, often I've been, I've been following this, the interests of this is serving are the people who are selling the phones, selling the devices, and so on. I think they're great, I think there's a lot of potential, but I think we also have to be aware of what's going on in terms of, um, in terms of who, who, who's controlling this, and that educators also have to have a part in this. And thank you very much. <laughs>
these traditional English foods and drinks are no longer foreign to you or your family, <laughs> as they might be to most Greek homes. You've grown familiar with them. They've become a part of you. You carry them with you. You've assimilated them. And lexical items, like tea time, bring us to the culture. Have you ever had to explain more dancing to your students? Or the maple? Or Guy Fawkes Day? Do you think that most Greeks know these things? And a step further, that they transfer that knowledge to impressionable, impressionable youth. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Your English is so good that you can use it to full advantage, I'm sure, in your private life, with books, newspapers, magazines, television, films, uh, music, the internet, as well as in your professional life. In studying to become qualified to teach English and daily preparing for your lessons, you no doubt expose yourself and your students to English architecture, art, law, literature, music, <laughs> philosophy, religion, science, and sports, besides the actual language. Now, just knowing these things makes them part of your own consciousness. There's even a name for this psychological phenomenon, the exposure effect, or mere exposure effect, or familiarity principle. It's when people feel a preference for things or people because they've had prior contact with them. And advertisers have long known that this works. So what about you who teach English? You who preach English? How many times have you had to teach, for example, please and thank you and you're welcome and excuse me and I'm sorry and pardon me? But have you sometimes surprised yourself by being more polite in Greek? How many times have you had to explain English punctuality about being in time and on time and has this influenced you to become more punctual or expected in others? Organization. Something will say that the way we arrange ideas is culture-bound and that English is more linear. We get straight to the point. Surely you teach your students to do so in your exam-based tasks. But has this logic transferred over to your Greek line of thinking? Or ideas themselves. Many classroom texts and photos express very English opinions about things like animal rights. Has this influenced your train of thought? <laughs> As in mindsets, each language carries with it images and perspectives. What about the Greek expression, oli i kali horane? There's room for all good folk. It embodies Greek, Greek hospitality, and when I use it, I, op I open up new horizons in my own mind. So what are you incorporating into your psyche when you teach the English language expression, children should be seen but not heard? <laughs> or they should speak only when spoken to. Very different from the Greek. You've had tremendous exposure to English, and I ask you, has it perhaps widened your perspective? Are you now more tolerant towards difference, more open-minded towards people from other cultures? And turning to the brain itself, do you ever accidentally use English, especially after lessons? Do you ever forget a word in English or in Greek? If being bilingual means being able to use two languages interchangeably, then teaching has actually changed your brain. Most researchers say the two languages never turn off. They're constantly competing with each other to see which language in which word will pop out. This fighting makes bilinguals slower at finding the right word than monolinguals, but it also exercises the brain's executive control system, which you use to make choices. Studies show you may multitask better and that you may have a delay in the onset of Alzheimer's.